So I'm not out walking today, nor not at the moment, I'm about to head out. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to share this video with you today that um, follows on from what we saw around the developments around the top of Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Circus and down Charing Cross Road. The destruction of the Old Falls Building is particularly kind of painful still to my heart. And I actually followed the campaigns to save Soho and save Timpan Alley, Denmark Street, from January 2015 for about a year through to um, early 2016. And I made a series of four films over that period that were for a, a different YouTube channel. And so looking back at that now, I've seen where that development has gone. It's really interesting to look back at these campaigns, these valiant campaigns to save really what is the heart of London. It's quite poignant in this video to see you know, the old Falls building with an amazing rooftop gig by the Bermondsey Joyriders organised by Henry Scott Irving of the Save Tim Pan Alley campaigns. I was there when it was the, the, the day they were moving out of the 12 Bar Club. The 12 Bar Club had shut the night before and they were unloading all their equipment into a van. That was quite sad and poignant to capture. And also I was taking a tour of some of the sort of surviving live music venues in Soho. And it makes you wonder how they're faring at the moment and whether they've come through the lockdown as we potentially enter into another one that's had a really quite a profound effect on live music and live music venues and musicians. So a lot of the things that I captured over that year really kind of still resonate quite strongly into the current period, not just the destruction of the physical environment. Hi Stephen, we're here from Hello. ITV London. Hello. Um, how did the meeting go in there? Well, I can't speak specifically about the meeting itself, but I don't think I'd be giving too much away to say that uh, all those who care about Soho hope that it will retain its distinctive characteristics for the foreseeable future, forever in fact. It's managed to do so over a hundred or so years and it would be a great shame were it not to do so. And the, um, the property owners um, and uh, the uh, residents and people like us who represent uh, performing artists and so on who've had a long relationship with Soho are all agreed and all on the same page about that. There's no disagreement. It's just a question of how it can be done. And uh, a lot of it is to do, I think, with persuading government <laughs> That, um, that Soho is a very special case. It's a special area and it's a special case when it comes to planning and all the rest of it. I'm here with Tim Arnold from Save Soho and we're stood here outside the iconic 12 Bar Club in Denmark Street and Tim's from a campaign called Save Soho. Um, unfortunately, it's too late to save the 12 Bar. Ah, hello, we're talking about your wonderful club. Everybody is. <laughs> when, when, do you, when do you shut? Today. You, is it really sad at the moment for you? Yeah, 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 I guess. We've known for a month, so. We, can we come over? And why is it closing? Uh, because of uh, development in this area based around the Crossrail project. So there's a, um, a group of developers that own a lot of the properties along this street, and this is the first one to buy the dust. What was people's reaction when they heard you were closing? A so? uh, mixture of, you know, sadness, disbelief, oh, yeah. anger. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Indifference. But <laughs> mainly the first three. Mm. That's really sad. I know, I know the landlords have said that they're going to sort of maybe reinstate something in the future. Uh, and I really hope they, they, they stick to that because we need it. There are less and less small venues like this in central London. TfL came along, cleared the site for. Uh, the, the owners and um, th this is the natural progression to um, revamp the area. What do they want to do with it? The, uh, I've got no idea. They'll probably just want to um, pull it down, I should think. Not the front, but the back. How old is the building? Uh, I believe it's um, Georgian. We're the internationally known 12 bar club. So. And what does it mean for it to be closing? That's life, isn't it? it you know, things happen. Well, was it John Lennon said, life's what happens while you're making other plans? And uh, that's, that's what's happened. So. Look what happened to him. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> 
Denmark Street is is really the, sort of the epicenter of the British music industry, isn't it? Tim Pan Alley. You've heard of Tim Pan Alley, I'm sure. It was a centre of music publishing in the in the like the 1910, 1912. Yeah. yeah. And then it goes right through where we stood now. Out, we're still outside Regent Studios, and this is where the Rolling Stones recorded. Yeah. Um, along here, number nine. Uh, so is it number six? Is where Sex Pistols lived upstairs, and that's where they did their early demos. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that the, the musical history here, the heritage is so strong. My name's Andrew Ellis, and I used to work in Denmark Street at number six for um, a sleeve design agency called Hypnosis, who did all the famous sleeves of Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and Paul McCartney. They were the guys that floated the pig over Battersea Power Station um, and designed Dark Side of the Moon and uh, did all sorts of uh, amazing creative work here. And, and that was back in the day, sort of 1979, 1980, 81, um, when the Sex Pistols used to rehearse behind our studio. Um, and I used to walk up the stairs and, and see all the jumble of letters downstairs in the backyard for the great rock and roll swindle, you know. And then Glenn Matlock lived upstairs, in the flat upstairs, which is why the band were always rehearsing around the back and going up and down the stairs. But, you know, we had Peter Gabriel, Paul McCartney, um, all the constituent elements of Led Zeppelin, uh, all coming in and out of uh, number six, uh, with Zeno's Greek bookshop underneath, back in the day, yeah. I'm all for you know redeveloping parts of London and, and, and keeping up with the 21st century, but there are certain pockets that need to be saved, like Mad Street in Soho is another one full of beautiful buildings that I walk through. Quite often I used to be a film runner, so I used to run through the streets of Soho at the age of 20, 23, um, taking stuff down to all the film editing suites. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just such a beautiful special area and it deserves to be saved. Do you think you're in danger of losing the essence of, of Soho? I think you lose, you're in danger of losing the essence of London, more to the point. You know, you've got to have these cultural uh, hotspots, if you like. Um, it's, you know, look at what's happening in Shoreditch. I hope that they're not going to, to absolutely ruin everything that's down there as well. Folgate Street, where um, Dennis Saver's house is. Places like that, that are, that are really special and a part of, of, of London. Uh, uh, London's rich heritage. Otherwise, it's all just going to get wiped away by developers. and. Um, it's not what, what should happen. So it's just over here, uh, it, it's the site that used to be the Astoria. Um, I played there in the 90s with Baby Bird and uh, just further on down the road there was another van venue called the LA2 which then became the Mean Fiddler. They're both gone now and, um, and obviously this is to do with the Crossrail uh, which is about bringing more people into London. Um, but the concern of uh, both residents and people in the entertainment industry is that what are they coming into London to see if they're ripping down some of the most incredible uh, venues, iconic venues. Uh, you know, everyone from the Beatles uh, to the Smashing Pumpkins have played uh, at this door, yeah. So this is um, Jazz After Dark on Greek Street and um, this is really well known because Amy Winehouse performed here so many times and, um, and it's kind of become synonymous with Amy in a lot of ways. Um, so at the moment this is still going strong, you can get a gig here and um, uh, it, it's open pretty much five or six nights a week and we're Save Soho are going to look into to see how protected this is and also for its usage because that's the one thing that's a real concern is that the usage of a lot of buildings um, can just be changed overnight. Uh, we hope that this venue remains as a live music venue for up and coming performers. Um, this is one of the last basement venues, music venues in Soho, which has been like, you know, it's, you've got Gaz's Rocking Blues has been running here oh, yeah, been, for many yeah, years. Do you, do you want to talk about uh, is that no, what this have, club stands for? The first groups used to have in 63, 64, then we used to have every night different groups. Uh, even Ronnie Blackwell, you, you don't know him, he was a record drummer. <laughs> for my time. He wrote record long before your time. Joe Strummer, he played here with the uh, 101 -er, and he even made a, a song about me, Sweetie in the San Moritz. So that, that, this is what we're talking about protecting in Soho. Sweetie in the it, San Moritz. Not Morris. just the places, but the faces as well. And we want, we, you know, as long as, yeah. as long as you're here, this venue is safe, isn't it? Yeah, well, I could stop because I'm 77 now, you know. We could stop one of these things. looking good on it. Last week I came down here at Denmark Street and I did a report on how 
the 12 bar club was closing and we were here on a very poignant day with Tim Arnold as they were moving all the stuff out of the 12 bar and it was the last day of the 12 bar but the 12 bar is alive the 12 bar has been occupied and it is now an open social space And how long do you think this space will keep going for, though? Um, I don't know, until they get a court order, I guess, to officially get them out. But mm. at the moment, they seem to be here for the time being, and, and they plan to be having community meetings every week. So if uh, any local residents or performers or anybody who's interested wants to come and see what they're up to, they're welcome to come and have a look. They're a very friendly bunch and they'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, my name's Craig Temple. Oh, great. You were playing tonight, you are on the stage? Yeah, I just went over and, and played a few songs. And, what, the course. and what's your connection to the venue? Um, I worked in Enterprise Studios, which if you go through that door there, there's a little alleyway, and over the road from that is the rehearsal studios where I worked. Um, I worked there for nine years, I was the manager for about two or three, um, and ever since I worked there, because it was that place was also owned by the same people that owned here, uh, used to hang out here all the time, used to have lock-ins till six in the morning when I first started, passing around guitars. Uh, it's part of, I guess, where I cut my teeth as a musician, really. Um, well, amazingly, we're back in Denmark Place, and uh, I'm Henry Scott Earn, and this was a thriving hub of activity, because to our left there used to be a tattoo parlour, and just to south of it, Enterprise Studios, where bands used to come and rehearse seven days a week, uh, about 15 rooms there. And to the right here, the old forge, the ancient doors to the ancient 17th century forge, which was the 12 Bar Club, which has been squatted, I believe, by a bunch of guys who call themselves Occupy London. And we are Save Tin Pan Alley. We started on May 7th to heighten awareness about the redevelopment of Tin Pan Alley. And our message is don't let the music die. In Tin Pan Alley. How do you feel what's happening? I think it's a disgrace. I think it's a total lack of respect for music. Um, it's it's not appreciating what makes London great and it's part of a whole part of just mass gentrification that's been going on in all of London for a number of for a number of years. But the difference is with this place is that this is ground zero for music for music in London but also music in the UK. You have the entire history of Regent Sound Studios and the Kinks recording there, Black Sabbath recording there. Henry. Yes. Where are we and what's going on? Well, here we are in Charing Cross Road, and this is the former Foils building, and it appears that the people who thought they had a one-year lease agreement on this have been given 48 hours notice to evict the building by Soho Estates. So I'm not sure that's strictly legal, um, we're sympathisers with the Save Soho campaign, but of course we're over the road, just over there at Denmark Street, as the Save Tin Pan Alley campaign, and we thought we'd put on a gig here in support of uh, these poor people who uh, run the cafe here on the uh, third floor. They've been here for 13 years, and they've got 48 hours to vacate the building, so not so great, really. And uh, we've got the fabulous Bermondsey Joyriders playing some kick-ass rock and roll on the roof. We're the Bermondsey Joy Riders, and uh, believe it or not, we're from Bermondsey. And um, we've been quite concerned with what's happening in the areas of Denmark Street in particular, because one of our favourite clubs was there, the 12 Bar Club. We've got a song about that, we might play that later on. And uh, Henry Scott Irvine's been very kind to book us today to play up here on the rooftop, so we're going to do a bit of a rocky thing. All right. has a purpose. Around you, you can see 16 cranes right across London's skyline. And I ask you, has London had a voice in having these cranes here to rebuild this city? Alright, that's it. Thanks very much for listening with the Bermsey Joyriders. I'm in uh, Denmark Street with Henry Scott Irvin from the Save Tin Pan Alley campaign. 
I met Henry about a year ago when we were here, the weekend that the 12 Bar Club uh, closed its doors for the last time. A very sad occasion. So I'm going to speak to Henry here. He's going to tell us what's happening with the Save Tim Pan Alley campaign and, and what's happening in this vibrant heart of what was once the centre of London's or Britain's music industry. It looks like Denmark Street is still thriving, the guitar shops are still here, but above the shops, all the music businesses that were here have pretty much gone. And that takes in quite a lot of music business because people only see the fact that it's guitar shops, but you also used to have agents, managers, recording studios, guitar makers. And one of the most important things that we're now trying to champion is the fact that this was where there were at least six guitar makers in the street. Now there is only one in the basement at 25, Andy Gibson. This was entirely music based until these landlords came in, who are also the developers. They've moved all the people above on the north side out. They've all vacated. So we need to continue to encourage, when Crossrail opens in 2018, music business to move back in. Musical heritage of Denmark Street is a very important thing because in 1911, a music publisher moved in called Lawrence Wright, and he set up The Melody Maker. It was Britain's first weekly music paper based in the street. It ran until the 1990s. It was also the home of British music publishers. Every single building in this street was a music publisher right through till 1992. That led to um, guitar shops opening here in the 60s and 70s, and they've been here ever since. But of course, it also became home of recording studios. There were three particularly famous studios here. There was Regent Sounds at number four, where the Rolling Stones recorded their very first album, Black Sabbath recorded there, Tom Jones, the Amen Corner. Further down the road you had Central Sound Studios where the Bee Gees recorded their first album. And on this side a lot of the publishers had their own studios, so you had uh, Keith Prowse Music had their own studios, Denmark Street Studios, Tin Pan Alley Studios. So you know, it was a home of recording studios too. Um, a thriving hub of music. And uh, this is what we really do want to continue to protect. It isn't just about the guitar shops. So here we are at the back of what was Denmark Place. And as you can see, the bulk of it has been demolished, which is also the rear of Denmark Street north side. So many of the guitar shops have lost uh, two thirds uh, or 50 percent in some cases of the back of their shops. Uh, having been offered upstairs, but it's uh, a huge space that's being created with something called the Now Building that's going to have huge cinema screens as a form of uh, new internet where people can buy and sell things in what is essentially a vast shopping mall. What was, uh, what was in uh, Denmark Place before? Denmark Place was uh, essentially um, small advertising agencies and uh, most notably enterprise rehearsal studios for bands. There was a uh, space for up to 30 bands to be able to rehearse and uh, practice making music. So it was uh, unique in that it was the only one in the West End of its kind where uh, musicians could come and rehearse. And of course, because there was the 12 bar club on the other side of it, a lot of them got gigs there and at the alley cat over the road. And this ancient alleyway that went back to the 17th century, one of London's oldest um, back alleyways they say a grubby back alleyway where drugs were taken. Well, drug taking will always happen in the West End. So what we're going to have now is a shopping mall, probably with men and hard hats and Alsatian dogs patrolling it at night time in what will be corporate hell. I think if we lost Denmark Street, it's a metaphor. It would be like the, the music industry is diminished because of the internet. If this street goes, it would be the death of British music. It is a beacon for British music. It is a metaphor for the fact that British music still thrives. People come from all over the world to buy guitars here. They are collector guitars, they are specialist guitars uh, that you wouldn't find on the internet. You need to pick a guitar up, look at it, play it, see which parts have been replaced, 
see if it's a fake, see how it sounds. That's what's special about being able to come here. You can't do that by ordering a guitar on the internet and sending it back. It wouldn't work. Well, the, the shop itself, before uh, we took over, was called Andy's. And in amongst all this, have you had famous people still coming into the shop to, uh, yeah. in the light of all this? Who have you had recently that might be? Noel Gallagher. Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson had a few um, uh, a session oh, oh, with oh, Mary McCarthy. Shall we have a look upstairs? Can we have a look upstairs? Shall we do that? Let's go. It's a great old building, isn't it? It is. It was built in this in the, at the end of 17th century, as far as 1670, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And it's uh, quite strong. I remember someone came in once, uh, an old lady, she was about 65, and she uh, went upstairs, which is here, and then she went back downstairs again. And she said, she said she used to live there in that you know, little corridor. Her room was there. This used to be like a lounge. <laughs> and downstairs used to be a cafe. And now yes, she, she said the, the, the year 1955. And she said, everything else was the same around here. Even the tube was the same, was in the same place. Yeah. And the I think church, was, I think the buildings, Ju the Julie's buildings Cafe. Was, Julie's Cafe, I think it was called there. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So I, think it's most, I think it's the only street that's ever left in, in the world. I just went to the States and there's nothing like it. Yeah. Thinking about, I've been to LA, Seattle, and then San Francisco, there's nothing like it. Even in New York, they don't have it anymore. 48th Street is gone. Just a few shops left. That's very sad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, I, I, I was actually surprised that they don't have as much choice as we do here. Really? Yeah, this street has got so much more choice than anything in the USA. When this is all finished, it's going to be, I think, amazing. I'm, I'm looking from a positive point of view, because people, like I say, they only hold into the past, you know. London is never, is never going to stay the same. It has to move on. And that's the way I look at it. You know. So uh, it's moved on. They've done this crossrail. Maybe not to to music shops' advantage, but uh, uh, at least you know it hasn't vanished yeah. at the moment. You know, it's still here. Well, that's a very good, positive way to su summarize the situation, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.